connect up. Okay. So I'm hoping you can see my screen. Yes. But we shall see how this goes. It always freezes a little bit um, when we're starting for some reason. So I'd like to thank James and um, ITTA and Westminster College for arranging this wonderful event, but also for kindly inviting me. So it's a pleasure for me to, mm -hmm. to be here with you. Um, obviously, if we didn't have COVID, we wouldn't be together because um, probably you wouldn't have been able to come to, to Turkey or to Ankara for a conference. And uh, often traveling to a conference is very expensive. Um, so in some ways, we can thank COVID for being able to be together like this today. That's very nice. Um, so as we said, this is the, the title. Um, so I think obviously our own experiences of, of COVID are probably very, very different. And uh, James has mentioned some rather unfortunate news from one of the presenters today. So obviously we've all been affected in very different ways um, during the last year. Um, James and I were just talking before, before we started that um, the last time we saw each other was actually March um, 2020 um, and at that time we were talking about um, the possibility of this terrible pandemic coming but I don't think any of us realized just quite um, what a deep impact it would have on all of our lives and um, obviously lives of many people all around the world so I put that picture there um, because I think that really represents what we've all been through um, during the last year and probably what we're going through now um, so half empty glass um, we can see it positively or negatively. Um, obviously, I don't think anybody's happy to have had COVID, um, but we can think about it in terms of opportunities and challenges. Yeah. So I've put there um, a changed world. Um, I could have put changing world because obviously the world is still changing, but I put changed world that world there using the simple past because I wanted to emphasize that maybe some things have changed forever. Um, so probably we're not going to go back to the old world, um, but what we're going to go to, what we might call the new normal, that's something we'll have to, to talk about. Um, so in terms of um, challenges and opportunities, I think um, obviously this, this event, as I said, is, a, is an opportunity. We wouldn't have been able to have this before. Um, as a presenter or a speaker, quite often going to a conference um, it used to be a very enjoyable experience. You'd meet lots of people. Um, you'd have a lot of time maybe in the coffee breaks to network and do other things. But on the other hand, um, you'd maybe spend a whole day traveling. Um, maybe for one hour presentation, you'd, it would take you a whole day. Whereas in, in, in the new world, um, you can spend one hour presenting and then the rest of the day you can, you can do other things. You can join the conference. Um, so there are positives and negatives. Um, I think some of these pictures may be familiar to a lot of you, um, certainly at the beginning, thinking about a year ago when, when things first started. Uh, maybe these are some of the emotions that we, we went through. Um, so people often talk about stress. Distraction, because quite often we are um, kind of confined to a little box on a screen. We live in a box on a screen rather than living in the real world anymore. Um, and obviously when we live in a small box on the screen, there are lots of other boxes on the screen and we're constantly distracted with emails or um, LinkedIn or Instagram or other things. So it's quite difficult to, to concentrate. Obviously fatigue because we're doing lots of different things. Um, possibly isolation. Um, so I think all of us as, as teachers or as um, educators, um, we love the human contact. We love being with people. Um, so obviously being with people online is really nice, um, it's not the same, so we can feel isolated. Um, and this might be quite difficult, so motivating yourself may be in some ways more difficult when you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Um, I can remember back in sort of March, April last year, being quite worried about the future, you know, worried in health terms, worried in terms of um, you know, friends and family, worried in, in terms of business. Um, so at that time, it was quite difficult to motivate yourself to do something. Um, and then obviously managing our time because um, things that we used to do that maybe were quite quick, maybe they're longer now because we have to think about fitting them onto a screen rather than doing something in, in person. But at the same time, I think wonderful opportunity. So 
personally, I think I've learnt a lot during the last year in terms of online teaching. Um, even though online teaching wasn't new, it wasn't unknown, we didn't all embrace it. We didn't all do it because we maybe preferred to do things that we'd always done. Um, so sometimes we need a kind of kick to force us to learn something new. So I'm thankful for that opportunity, certainly. Um, certainly, I think for a lot of us, it's made us more flexible, more adaptable. Um, so maybe preparing for the future, if the future is going to involve a lot more online and face-to-face -face teaching, then maybe we're a bit more ready for that now than we were a year ago. Um, and obviously we have the chance to form communities with people in many different countries. So um, I'm looking at the, um, the audience at the moment. I mean, it's wonderful to see people from so many different countries. Um, hi, Eriana, by the way. Nice to see you again. Originally from Albania, but uh, living in Turkey for a long time. Um, so it's, it's, it's great in a sense we can reach out more to, to people in other countries, other cities. That's really, really nice. Um, and obviously that gives us opportunities for development. I mean, um, I don't need to tell that to you because you're all here, all joining from different parts of the world at different times. Um, I imagine Luis in Ecuador, it's probably midnight there. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to have these, these opportunities. Um, something that I, I really like at the moment is actually being able to see you all because that's something I find quite difficult um, when you're teaching or when you're um, you know, presenting something and everybody has their, their cameras off, um, it can look as if you're looking at people because they, if everybody can see your eye contact as if you're looking at them. Um, but I find it quite um, challenging not seeing people because I like with an audience being able to, to monitor the eye contact and see whether people look, look bored or look, look um, enthusiastic, etc. Um, and of course, we could add to that things like online shopping and uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, positive and negative things, but we all have our own stories, obviously. We'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, yeah, so um, people all around the world. So, bear with me just a second. My uh, PowerPoint seems to freeze. So these are some of the things that I oh, seem to have stopped sharing the window. I don't know why that's happened. Just a second, sorry. PowerPoint has suddenly decided to uh, turn itself off for some reason. Very interesting if we can just um, bear with me a second when I get my PowerPoint back. This is a danger when you start talking about positive things of, um, of COVID. <laughs> it comes back to, uh, to haunt you here. Okay, if you can bear with me just a second. know what's happened here but PowerPoint has just turned itself off okay it hasn't turned off yet yet huh it hasn't turned off yet we can't see that moment okay so let me um, bring it back and see if I can um, show it with you just a second James will you give the presenters role again to Phipps I think I'm, I still have it. Just a second. Can you see? Can you see the screen now? No, no not yet. No, oh, there it is. It's coming. It's coming back. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Suddenly, PowerPoint just closed completely. Don't um, worry. You are the manager. You can uh, stop it. You can share it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. So I was just talking about learning online skills, but obviously there's uh, things I still need to learn. So uh, you have to learn. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So these are some of the topics that I was going to talk about a little bit. I mean, um, I don't think I need to talk a lot about what professional development is because obviously you know what it is, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, so that's uh, um, something. Um, I want to talk a little bit about reflexive practice, the so things that we can do that don't involve necessarily other people and money and things like that. Um, and I'll share with you a lot of online resources. I mean, obviously, um, most of you I don't know personally, so I don't know what you know, what you don't know. I didn't know who was going to be joining. So I've got a few slides that I can just quickly show. Um, and if there's something there that's, that's new and useful, you can perhaps have a look at um, in your own time. Okay. Um, because we're quite a small audience, I'm quite happy for you to um, 
jump in with any questions or comments during my talk or at the end, whichever you whichever you prefer. Yeah, sure. um, so obviously when it's uh, when there's 50 or 100 people, that's a bit difficult to manage, but we're quite a small group at the moment, I think 15, so uh, I think we can, yes. we can move ahead with that. Um, so I think we all know what professional development is. Um, I think you know, you'll be able to see these slides later um, you know, if you want to have a look at them in more detail later. But I think one of the important things is maybe the, um, the last quotation there, um, that the main goal of professional development is to sort of change our teaching so that we can help our students. So partly we're doing professional development for ourselves, for our own motivation, but hopefully, ultimately, it's leading on to better learning from our students. So I think that's something that we can um, always bear in mind. Obviously, we're all passionate about our job as teachers, so we know that we're doing it to help our, our students as well, but it's good to remember that. Um, and sometimes schools and institutions don't realise that. They think that professional development is just something um, for teachers. In a sense. So what is CPD? Um, James explained that earlier on. Um, but this, you know, sometimes people come up with different words for the C. Um, so I've heard sometimes people saying it's continued professional development, um, but that kind of implies that it's finished. It's something, oh, we did that when we were younger, um, in a sense. Um, continuous professional development sort of implies that it never stops, whereas continuing is quite good because it might stop. Um, you know, we might have a break for whatever reason, for personal reasons, other reasons. Um, it's quite normal that in our career that we may have a time where we, we want to just concentrate on our teaching and do nothing else. We may have a few years even where we don't do any professional development at all, and that's fine. Um, so it doesn't mean to be something that we have to be doing 24 hours a day. So it's something there um, that we can do when we want, in a sense. Um, so we can think about it as maybe a process rather than something that we tick, oh, I've done it now. Um, we can think about it more in the long term, maybe our whole life. Um, it can be done alone, it can be individual. Um, personally, I think it's kind of a way of life. Um, so, you know, I know there's lots of, um, lots of teachers who, um, you know, they're constantly looking at different things to do, different ways of doing things, and it's become a kind of way of life. It's not something extra that you do if you have time. It's just a way of, of um, living in a sense. Yeah. And it's really all about growing as an individual, as a person, as a, as a teacher. So don't need to talk about this too much because I think um, these are fairly obvious, obvious things. Um, so I don't know if, if any of you are aware of the, um, the Cambridge Teacher Development Framework. Um, I'll show you the link a little bit later on. Um, one of the things about this is that um, um, obviously you can you can look at it a bit more later on, um, but it's really all about trying to um, identify different ways of um, improving in a, in a sense. Um, so I'll just quickly show this to you. Um, we started a little bit late, so I don't want to talk through something which you can read later. Um, but. Uh, the idea behind this, this framework really is that um, it's, it's focusing on lots of different things that we can be, we can be doing. So I'll, I'll move on, um, and as I said, we'll share the slides with you later so you'll be able to, to read these at, at your own, own, own leisure. Okay. So obviously these are um, different activities that we can do. Um, and I think most of these we can do online as well as um, you know face to face in a sense. Um, obviously, the last one here, taking on different responsibility in our organisation. So if we are working offline, you know, online at the moment and not going into our school, um, then obviously we can do these things um, in that way. So I just put these things here. I mean, um, I don't think I need to talk through these. Um, these are things that we can do um, whether we have COVID or not. So it's quite nice to know that COVID doesn't necessarily stop us from doing things to develop. Um, it just may mean that we do them in different ways. Um, and that obviously brings challenges as well as opportunities for us. Yeah. Uh, Simon, can I add something here? Yeah, please do, yes. 
you said yes, that we can learn from our students, but we have a lot of expertise going through centuries about of teaching. Course. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why uh, we shouldn't ignore them, and we should get the expertise, as you said, through webinars, mm -hmm. uh, of course, with degrees or certificate programs. So I believe that that expertise is very important to uh, transfer it to the new generation. Of course, they are going to find their own way, but they should yeah. know these things as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, I think that, that that's very much related to um, what I'm going to talk about here. So if we think about um, ourselves as teachers, but um, I, th I know many of you are working in situations where you are um, training other teachers, you're educating other teachers. So um, if we can think about how teachers learn, so obviously, as Turan Hojam says, the input is very, very important. So what we know already um, from research, from literature, from going back maybe 50 years, um, that's often what we think of as received knowledge, um, which is very, very important. Yeah, And obviously, we can get that from webinars, from courses, from reading. Um, in addition to that, we've got our own kind of experiential knowledge, which is a different type of knowledge, which we get from observing other teachers. So that may be when, um, if we're doing a four-year degree course in ELT, um, quite often there's a mentoring program. Um, and the, the main aim behind the mentoring program is to observe competent, experienced teachers, see how they do it, and learn from that. Um, similarly, something like a CELTA course or a TESOL course quite often involves a lot of peer observation and, again, observing um, other people. Um, and I think these days, um, you know, reflection is something that's very, very popular. Um, often it's misunderstood, but I think the idea really is that whatever input we get, um, we need to reflect on it in terms of how relevant is it to me in my context, but also are there maybe conflicts between different writers in the literature? Are they saying different things? If so, which one could be right, which one could be wrong? Maybe they're all right, maybe they're all wrong. So being kind of critical when we um, read something, but also um, when we observe other teachers, for example. Um, when we think about our own experience, being critical of what has happened. If something hasn't worked, um, trying to think about reasons reasons why. Um, so I'm going to talk about reflective practice a little bit in a minute, um, but I think it's all about really bringing in that input, that experience from other people, and mixing that with our own experience um, to try and get somewhere. So I'll try and show this visually, um, if I can. So this is my sort of adaptation of Wallace's model, which is quite an old one now, but um, um, so the idea here really is that um, practice there means our teaching, our daily teaching. Yeah. So if we think of um, daily teaching, we go into class, we probably reflect a little bit on the lesson, um, we may make some small changes and the next week we may teach again and we may kind of go around in this cycle of, of, of reflecting. But often the reflection becomes kind of emotional. Um, so we react to our, our lessons um, using emotion. So all oh, oh, that, that went really well, or I, I wasn't very happy with that. And if it stays at the emotional level, we're not really analyzing it very much. So um, as Turan Hodja mentioned, the, the important thing about the received knowledge here coming in is that can maybe inform what we're doing. We can maybe get a new ideas. So rather than just asking teachers to start teaching and hope that they find their way, um, the idea of um, feeding something in from training, from research, from literature um, can kind of enrich that process. Um, so I think, of, I think of that sort of cycle here a little bit like the washing machine. Um, if you, I mean, I know we, 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 we're probably not that bored during um, COVID times if we actually watch the, watch the washing machine going round. But uh, I remember as a student, I used to have to go to uh, a special shop that had lots of washing machines in, and you had to sit there and wait. So you'd see the washing going round and round and round. And I think sometimes um, when teaching, we can, we can reach a stage where, um, almost like a kind of plateau, that we're just doing the same thing again and again and again. And it's a little bit to me like you put your clothes in the washing machine and you just press the button and it goes round and round and round and it probably comes out pretty much the same. Whereas if we add in 
um, some detergent or we add in some softener, then hopefully the, the clothes will come out better quality than they were when they went in. And that's, I think, really what reflective practice is all about. It's all about trying to feed in ideas from other teachers or from experts to try and maybe jumpstart um, our improvement and take us to um, another level. So and may I add something here, Simon? Yeah, please, Sajam. When, yeah. when I ask my students to reflect on what they teach, especially when they go to teaching practice schools, they reflect for me. And I say, you are going to write reflection yeah. paragraph mm -hmm. or uh, whatever you do for yourself. So I changed self-reflection <laughs> because yes. you could be aware of what you do rather than me. Because they think that it's a kind of burden to reflect to the teacher. No. Yes. You should get the habit of reflecting on your own so that you can see what are your strengths and weaknesses and how can you improve your weaknesses uh, by reflecting yourself. Maybe you can compare and contrast with other people. Thank you. Yeah, abs absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Hajjah. I mean, that's, re that's really, really important that quite often the reflection is done because you, you get a grade for it or you're kind of forced to do it. But really what we want is turning this into a kind of automatic process whereby maybe if we think of the washing machine as an example, that when you press the button automatically it brings in um, the detergent and the softener in a sense. So we want reflection to be a kind of way of life in a sense. So we may need to train teachers in how to do that um, and guide them, show them examples. So, I mean, one, one thing that I, I quite often suggest when um, teachers ask me, well, you know, how am I going to, I'm not taking a course, I'm not doing a mentoring program, I'm not taking a degree, um, how can I reflect? And I, I suggest this, I suggest, well, think about some part of your teaching that maybe you're not very happy with. It could be something that maybe the students are not responding in the way you want, so maybe um, you're trying to do some speaking activities and the students are, are just answering the questions quickly and then staying silent. Uh, maybe it's something you don't feel confident in, so maybe something like teaching pron pronunciation maybe, that you feel, oh my God, how can I do that? What if my accent's not perfect? Um, or it could be something that maybe somebody's given you feedback on. So choose an aspect of your teaching, um, small or large, um, and then think, okay, so what am I going to do um, about that? So it may be that the next time I teach that type of lesson, I'll take notes afterwards, think about what happened. Or maybe I audio record it, um, just turn my phone on, and just listen, listen to the lesson um, afterwards alone, maybe with the door closed or door locked. Um, just listen, take some notes and say, do I notice anything there that's, um, that's interesting that I haven't noticed before? Um, maybe if you're feeling confident, ask a colleague to come um, and observe the lesson for you um, and get their feedback or ask them to listen to the recording maybe. Um, and from that maybe identifying something that you can do differently. So it could be um, if you've got for example speaking activities and students are not responding maybe students need some preparation time before they start speaking. Maybe we can try that, we can try aha okay so I'll give students maybe two minutes to make some notes before they start speaking. Um, or I will put them in pairs to, to brainstorm and make notes, and then we will start the speaking, for example. So we can try that and then see, oh, did it make a difference? Um, and you maybe you see, well, actually, the students are speaking a little bit more. Aha, okay, so I'm still not perfectly happy, so what more can I do? Um, can I try something else as well? Maybe I can, I can show them a recording of some teachers doing the same speaking activity, they could watch that before they speak, um, and maybe that could be something that we'll do. So it's kind of like an ongoing cycle um, where we're, we're choosing something, as Turan Roger mentioned, um, it's, it's coming from ourselves. it's not somebody else telling us what to do, it's us mm. identifying something in our own teaching that we, we passionately want to improve and want to, to work on. And uh, there is one thing, uh, Simon, uh, yeah. you know, in our ELT departments, we have one semester uh, school experience, which means yes. students go through focused observation. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they learn to do focused observation, they can go on with a checklist or self-focused observation in their teaching life. That's why we have this course. Absolutely. That's, that's very important. So, for example, if, if I take my example of... Um, you know, I tried to do speaking with the students, it didn't work. Um, if I can be 
sent to observe a teacher um, specifically to watch how they do a speaking lesson, for example, that can be really, really useful. So making it focused observations rather than just observation where you tick, I've done it. And I think that's very important. Um, so obviously this reflection can be very informal or it could be more informal like an action research project. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about action research because obviously um, you know, you, most of you know about, about that. But that could be something for those teachers who want to make their um, reflection a little bit more formal. Um, that can involve doing something like action research and then maybe writing it up or presenting it later. So what you learn is valuable but if it, if it only stays within you it's a, a kind of a pity if you've done a lot of work it's nice to share that with with other colleagues um, so that's something that we can we can think about um, obviously depending on where you're working depending on the the culture of your um, your school um, it might be nice to try and arrange you know regular every week every two weeks um, just a little time informally where you come together to talk about an aspect of teaching. Again, that could be set up by the head of department, um, or it could be, could be something that comes bottom up from you know, one or two teachers who are interested. Um, and maybe the first time you meet, only two of you there, and maybe the next week, maybe three, and maybe in time more people um, would like to join. Um, but obviously, if you're working somewhere where you're the only one who's interested, um, that could be a bit um, disappointing if you, if you try that. Um, I remember when I was working in Germany, um, I remember suggesting that um, to the other teachers and they were horrified. They said to me, but we wouldn't be paid for coming for an hour to talk about things, so why should we do it? No. And I thought, okay, fine. <laughs> it was an idea. Um, so it's something that we can, we can do. And of course, online we can do this. Um, and if we form online communities among um, colleagues in different countries, then we can get a very, um, you know, fresh... Um, idea on, on something. So there may be something that we're doing that's not working, but we find somebody in another country who's doing something and it's working really well, we can, we can learn from that um, as well. Um, obviously something like this event obviously is really, really good, but um, you know, we can do that in our own institutions. We can suggest having some kind of event um, at the end of the year um, where teachers present something that they've done. So it doesn't always have to be a conference with, with experts necessarily. Um, we can encourage teachers just to present something that they've done. It could be a lesson or an activity and what they've learned from it. So it could be something coming out of action research or from reflective pr practice, exploratory practice. So trying to encourage teachers to, to, to share ideas, share what they've learned. Um, because you know, if we're all working individually, we're all learning something, but we're not sharing it. So that's something that we can, we can think about trying to, to do. So um, in terms of resources, um, again, it's, uh, it's quite difficult because I know you've, you've all got very different backgrounds and different levels of experience. So I don't want to be um, sort of, you know, showing you things that are fairly obvious. But um, I think the first one, the CPD framework, is something that um, I think could be quite useful either for yourselves or um, those of you working with teachers could be quite useful. So there's lots of different frameworks. I'm going to show you the, um, the Cambridge one because that's the one that I was involved in, in drawing up. So the idea behind a framework is really, um, as a teacher, quite often we can think, well, you know, I've been teaching for eight years or ten years. Um, obviously, I've learned lots of things, but where am I? Um, we may know where we, where we are in terms of have I done a, a master's, have I done a PhD, um, but in terms of our development as a journey as a teacher or instructor, it can be a bit confusing sometimes to know where we are. Um, so these are sort of questions that we, um, we may have in our mind. And then the link there is for the, 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 um, the website where you can get a lot of information about this framework. So basically, the framework sort of suggests that we go through four phases in our journey as teachers. Yeah? Um, and we may or may not reach the, um, the final stage of expert. We may be expert in some areas of teaching, but maybe not in others. Yeah? So the idea really is that um, within these different categories, 
which of course have frozen again, sorry about that. Um, it will come in a second. So. Apologies. So this is a kind of self-evaluation tool um, where teachers go, go online, there's a questionnaire that goes with it, and basically um, there's these different sub-areas um, so the first one is about learning and the learner. So this is more about, for example, student psychology, um, how learners learn, how we interact with students. The second one might be about how we teach vocabulary, how we teach writing, for example. Um, language proficiency is obvious. Language awareness is, for example, how well are we able to analyze, um, for example, present perfect continuous to be able to teach it well. Um, and with the, each of these categories, there are questions that we um, respond to, and that kind of gives us a profile of where we are at that moment in our career. So it's not meant as a, an evaluation tool where you evaluate other teachers. It's supposed to be a self-evaluation tool. Um, this is a kind of more detailed version. Obviously, I'm not going to go over that with you. Um, and then what, what, what this leads to is sort of suggestions for activities that you can do um, to improve depending on where you are in each of the, the different areas. So these are just suggested activities um, and a lot of these suggested activities are free activities, things that don't involve um, spending any money um, but there are also suggestions of short courses that you could take, some of which are free, some of them may not be free. Um, so this is obviously just one example. We also have um, British Council, for example, have their own um, framework um, there are different frameworks around so from that um, there is there are sort of a page like, like this where you have suggestions of things that you could watch or read or do or study um, and related to each of those are lots of different websites um, that you can you can click on links where you can get um, resources you can get ideas to focus on so the thing I like about the, the Cambridge site is everything is kind of linked. Um, sometimes it can, I find it can be quite bewildering. You know, you, um, you go on LinkedIn or Instagram and there's, you know, everybody's giving you all these free webinars and, and things, but it, it, sometimes it's quite difficult to see where you're going with these. You know, you may be doing lots of things. The nice thing about a framework is it kind of gives you a sense of where you are um, and a sense of purpose. So, if it's something that you haven't seen before, I suggest maybe you have a look at the, um, the website there, um, play around with it, see if there's anything there that um, is interesting. It doesn't mean you have to only um, go to Cambridge website, of course, so you could still um, do lots of things from you know, a million other, other websites and organisations, um, which I'll show you later on. So I just wanted to share that with you, because I think that can be quite useful. There's also um, a digital... Um, version of that digital um, teacher framework, um, which is quite nice. So again, the website is there. Um, and that's quite good because it gives you lots of suggestions, again, within a framework about how to improve um, our online teaching skills. Um, I'll have to check there later on to see if it says anything about um, using PowerPoint with Zoom and why my PowerPoint keeps freezing. I think it's because I've got an old version of PowerPoint. It needs upgrading. I think that's my, my issue. But um, so, um, again, the idea here is that you have a look at the different categories, um, there's a self-evaluation tool, and then there are tips about how you can improve yourself in the different areas. Um, so you may find this, this useful. Um, it may be something for yourselves or for um, recommending to teachers that you're, you're working with. Um, obviously, there's lots of other um, websites. So I mentioned pronunciation earlier on. Um, Macmillan have a really good pronunciation app um, for your phone. Um, so it's really good because you can download it on your phone um, and you can play around with all the sounds so that you can click on the sounds. It gives you an American pronunciation or a British pronunciation, for example. Um, you can test yourself. There's lots of things that you can do. So anybody who's uh, feels that they, they would like to be teaching more pronunciation with students but they don't feel confident, this can be a really good um, tool and it's also a good tool for students um, because they can work on it in their own time and certainly those students who love doing things on the phone, this is a really nice, um, very user-friendly application. Um, obviously lots of other um, 
applications and things that can be useful for um, ourselves or for, for students. So I'm not going to go over all of these one by one, but um, they're on the screen. So um, as I said, we'll make the, the slides available to you later so that um, you know if you want to explore any of these, you, you can do. Um, obviously, there's lots of blogs and websites um, that can be very, very useful. Um, the Lex Tutor one here at the top, that's a really nice um, website, if you like, if you're really interested in teaching vocabulary. There's lots of really nice tools there where you can, for example, um, you can put in a text that you've, let's say a text that you've written for your students, could be, you know, reading text or a listening text, and you can put it in and it will analyze that text and color code it for you depending on the frequency of the words. It will tell you, for example, how many of the words in your text are in the first 1,000 words, how many are in the next 1,000 words, how many of them are really, really um, infrequent words, and it color codes that for you. Um, it's also something we can use for collocations, for example. Um, so lots and lots of different um, tools that we can use and we can recommend to our, our students as well. Um, obviously lots of magazines um, that we can access online, um, obviously lots of courses. Um, Future Learn is quite a nice um, one. It has lots and lots of courses in lots of different areas, um, probably things that you've never even thought of before. Um, some of them can be free, some of them um, we have to pay for. But they, you, know, you can take courses in areas nothing to do with ELT at all. Um, that could be something useful. Um, obviously webinars, um, these are only some of them, I know there's lots of other um, webinars, I know James um, organises lots of webinars as well, so um, um, you know, that's, that's something that we can, we can look at. Um, so obviously, you know, for ourselves it can be quite bewildering, as I said, not knowing, you know, there's so much that we can do, but sometimes it's too, there's too much choice, um, a bit like sometimes you know, in, in the old days when we went to restaurants, you know, you'd go to some restaurants, you'd have a menu that's maybe 10 pages or 20 pages, and it takes you maybe half an hour to go through them, and you wish that there was just a simple menu. Um, so we might think about preparing our own menu um, of resources for teachers that we're working with or for, for students as well. Um, and obviously, um, training courses, um, and James obviously has a lot of courses as well that um, um, are very, very useful. So going back to what I was saying earlier about sort of coping um, with COVID, I mean, um, obviously it's, you know, we can think about it not just in terms of ELT, but beyond. Um, but some of the things that, that I find quite useful is, um, you know, we can, we can get very stuck with the, the negatives of the situation in terms of our work, you know, in terms of our... Our, our, our jobs, our teaching, and also our learning, our development. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we think of you know the pandemic as being a kind of trauma, um, there are certain stages that, that psychologists recommend that we go through to kind of deal with trauma. And one of the essential stages is kind of accepting the situation um, rather than resisting it or denying it. Um, and once we can accept, well, this this is just this is the world now. Um, then it can help us to maybe be a bit more patient with ourselves um, and realizing that it may take time before um, we reach a kind of balance in our lives again that we feel we feel comfortable we feel that we can we can live and we can work in, in, in a way that we um, we feel comfortable and maybe sharing is very important so even though we're not seeing um, our friends our colleagues um, finding a way to be open and, and share our feelings about you know things that we're happy with things that we're not happy with and um, that could be very very um, important maybe um, so I've put a picture of chocolate there with self-motivation um, just because I think chocolate is something that um, when we eat it we get a kind of immediate feedback we feel good very quickly mm -hmm. um, whereas often if we're thinking about you know professional development or something like that we, we put in effort but the reward comes later it's not like chocolate it's not an immediate reward and that can be quite difficult for self-motivation because um, I know you know in the morning when I um, 
before I start working, I get myself a coffee, um, I have a piece of chocolate, and that kind of energizes me for the next um, hour or two. Um, but often it's quite difficult to self-motivate yourself when you're at home. Um, so, you know, it's something to work on, really. It's something setting yourself maybe small goals. Um, time management is, uh, I don't think it's something that we can do and say, I've learned it, I've done it. It's a constant battle. Um, you know, we can plan our time very well, but then something will always come up. Um, and I know a lot of um, schools that people are working in, um, you know, maybe you get the, the timetable changes every week because there are new decisions from the government about how much face-to-face -face teaching, um, how much online teaching. Um, so it can be quite difficult. Um, these are my personal views here. I mean, I think, you know, everybody talks about this idea of new normal. It's a kind of fashionable term to use. But what does it really mean? We don't really know. Um, but I would imagine that the future is going to include some form of blended or hybrid learning. I don't think it's something that we're going to get rid of. I think a lot of people around the world are going to say, well, we've learned so much about online teaching. Um, there are lots of good things about it that can be incorporated. It doesn't mean that we, we use it to replace the face-to-face, -face, but it's a kind of very useful add-on to face-to-face. -to -face. So um, I think what we've learned from online is going to be something that um, stays with us. Um, and that, of course, the subject of my talk, I mean, in terms of CPD, that means we have lots of, of wonderful opportunities. Um, I mean, I never thought a year ago um, that the courses that I'm involved in, in giving, that we would have people from, from China, from Russia, from Brazil, from Romania, um, joining these courses, because in the past, that would only be possible if they came here in the summer for two months. Um, so that's been that's been wonderful, being able to work with so many different people in different um, different places. Yeah. So, you know, this is a difficult one. Embracing change, um, mm. we are, as we say, uh, there's a, a term, maybe not a very nice term in English, but it says that we are creatures of habit. Um, mm. In other words, that we like our routines and we like our habits. Um, so James likes going into his office and sitting there um, at a certain time every day. Um, I have got used to not doing that, and for me that's my, my kind of new normal. So um, as Jane mentioned, I worked in the university for 20 years where every day I would go in um, and I would be in, at my desk at 8, eight o'clock in the morning. I would have my coffee before I started work. And when I started working from home about seven years ago, it was a big change, it was quite difficult. So I'm quite lucky that um, I've been used to working from home for quite a while. So when the pandemic came, it wasn't a big change for me, that part of it. Um, the big change was not having any of the, um, the other contact, obviously. Um, so wonderful opportunity to improve our skills. Um, I was at the, um, the TESOL Turkey conference last, last week. Um, and there was a speaker, Elena Schmidt from America, um, who talked about this term of online language pedagogy, which is something that um, probably is not yet in any of the um, education faculties curriculum, um, but I think it will be in the future. Um, it's something we're going to, to put in um, because it's something, part of it is the same as normal teaching, but there are some things that are, are different as well. So that's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful that we've been given an opportunity to develop ourselves and learn some new skills which we're going to be able to use in the future. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is difficult, um, being flexible, being adaptable. We all have different personalities. Some of us like things to always be the same. Some of us can cope with things being different, but um, trying to plan as much as we can is perhaps all we can, we can do there. Um, so trying to maybe set up communities with, with friends. So um, you know, when you meet people at, at events like this, trying to stay in touch excuse me, can be very, very useful. And obviously, you know, I think wonderful opportunities. I mean, just thinking about Turkey, for example. I mean, I'm based in, in Ankara. I've been in Ankara for about 34 years. Um, and most of the teachers that I, I work with on a regular basis are based in Ankara. Um, sometimes we have teachers from Eskisher or Karabük or Konya who are quite close, 
Um, but recently we've been able to work with teachers from Gaziantep and from much further away and teachers have said, well, for years I've wanted to take your course, but I haven't been able to because, you know, I have a kid, I can't come to Ankara for a month or two months. Um, so lots of wonderful opportunities for people. And I think in the future, you know, I think about the CELTA course, that's uh, one of the courses that I'm involved in. It's been wonderful that now um, Cambridge allows the course to be run online or face to face. So it's, it's there for the future. It was a, a kind of stopgap for um, for COVID just for a short period of time, but they've realized that it's, you know, we can run the course just as well as when we do it face to face. So it's there as an option. Um, and I think that's that's wonderful for people like James and myself who provide courses, but also for individual teachers from around the world who want to take courses. So we're not limited to where we live. Um, you know, we have the possibility of looking at courses of many different countries and choosing the one that we think is um, is best. Um, so I think that's that's really great. So maybe going back to my half empty, half full glass, um, maybe you can see the picture there. So the half um, full could be at the top rather than the bottom so that we think of the, the positive before the negative maybe. And Simon, can I add something here? Please do, Roger, yes. Uh, I have my PhD and MA courses online. Well, it is, you know, compulsory now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I had one course before the COVID online, and I found it much more useful for my, st for my students than face-to-face. -face. You know why? Because they have their own students, they have their own classes. So they get the ideas, they discuss it with you, they go and uh, practice it with their own students, and they bring lots of reflection. So yeah. we discuss, so it's a kind, it becomes some kind of puzzle solution or problem solution altogether based on theory and practice. Absolutely. So I find yeah. it much more useful than face-to-face -face, uh, lectures or face-to-face -face courses. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ajam. I think that's so important because you know, if, if, if we put our hand in our hearts and say, you know, um, let's imagine that in the summer um, COVID goes away and we go back to a normal life, mm -hmm. would we prefer um, to have some form of online teaching still there? And how much of that would we want that to be 100% or 50%? Um, so lots of advantages. I mean, uh, you know, one big advantage is we still have to iron our shirts, but we don't need to iron our trousers anymore because nobody sees them. Um, so that's a big, uh, a big, a big change. So there's some final um, thoughts. I mean, you know, some people get um, quite irritated when people talk about positive thinking, but I think it is something important. I mean, uh, you know, the world is changing. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I think whenever we think that tomorrow is, is clear and we know what it's going to be, um, life surprises us. Um, so I think, you know, the, the more we can think positively about um, the changing world, I mean, not in terms of health, I don't mean that, but in terms of, um, you know, work and, and, and our own, own careers, our own development, I think that can be really, really, really helpful. Um, and I think we, we probably all believe this ourselves. That's why we're here this morning on a... Um, what is a Sunday morning for us or uh, for Luis and Ecuador midnight on, um, on, on Saturday. Um, but, you know, it's something that it's kind of a, a lifelong journey. Um, and it's a journey not just about learning about ELT, but of self-discovery, discovering about ourselves. So that's why um, Turan Hoja meant self-reflection is so, so important there. Um, and, you know, even though when teachers graduate as teachers, um, we call them teachers, we say they're teachers, but actually developing teaching skills can, t can last a whole life. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Yeah. So I just want to share this. I mean, it's uh, something that uh, I sometimes show. So whenever we're, whether we're teaching or training or, um, you know, master's, PhD courses, we can think about not just the content of what we're doing, but the way we do it. So um, if we're using online tools, so are we doing something which is inspiring other people? Um, so we can think about sort of moving towards so aspiring to a stage where we can be confident that we are actually inspiring other people. Um, and obviously the picture's nice because the sun is coming up. We're sort of looking forward to a future where um, we can go back to a previous life. So. Um, I'd just like to finally thank a couple of my colleagues, Suzanne and Simga, who um, 
um, helped me prepare the presentation, helped me, especially with some of the resources, getting the resources together. Um, thank you again to James for organising everything. Thanks to Turan Hojem for a lot of very insightful um, comments and uh, adding things to what I had to say. So I think we have a few minutes left for questions or, or comments, James. If that, is that right? Uh, you're right, yes. Uh, we've got, I think, five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so um, as I said, I can, I can make the, um, the slides available to you all. Um, I don't know how the best way of doing that, whether I, um, um, uh, I send them to, to James and you distribute them, or is there another way of doing that? Uh, because I, I, I'm not re really in touch with the audience here. Uh, um, we, we didn't have any registration, it's free to public, so they just uh, drop in. And I okay. think we can do one thing. Uh, you have shared your email address. The yeah. One, the one so I've got my email address there. So if you if you want, um, we can just do it. If you email me, then I can send you the slides. Yeah, that would be great, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, or you can take a <laughs> you can take a picture of the email there if you want. Uh, I've got uh, one more thing, Simon. Uh, yeah. The, the reco the recordings of all sessions, including yours, mm -hmm. uh, would be uploaded to ITTA Turkey channel on YouTube tomorrow. So, okay. so oh, yeah, everyone can have access to the videos, to the recordings once more. They can watch it again if they want. Uh, and then, yeah, your email address is there as well. Okay. And thank you, Aysan, for your nice comments. Thank you very much. That was really uh, thoughtful and uh, inspiring. And uh, you, have, you have gone through all the aspects, uh, both without online and online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hachan. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, very nice to see you all and um, enjoy yeah. the rest of your day. And the, um, I wish you a very fruitful, healthy year. And uh, please yeah. stay stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh,